Stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on the Innovation Show, it's an honor to welcome Dr. Ruben Nyman, author of Hush, a book of bedtime contemplations, and Ruben can be found at drnyman.com. Ruben, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the show. I reached out and we touched base about the importance of sleep from, from an entrepreneurial and an innovative perspective, because I really saw a lot of your work and you were talking about dream deprivation, etc., which we'll touch on. But I was thinking that sleep is such a, an important part of the mix for an entrepreneur or any type of business person that it's often overlooked and, and it's also of, often worn as a badge of honor almost to not sleep so much and people kind of going oh i worked a 20-hour day and, and i'd love to just open that conversation up uh, ruben if you would just tell our audience about yourself well i'm i'm a clinical psychologist I've had a, a long-standing interest in, in sleep and dreams. It uh, probably goes back to my childhood, certainly to my adolescence. Uh, I became interested in consciousness. Uh, it's a very, very slippery notion when I was a kid, and still it's my primary interest. Um, with, with regard to sleep, I was originally trained as a Jungian-oriented dream therapist and did that for many years. Um, I got very interested in dreaming uh, as it was associated with cancer and uh, worked with a lot of cancer patients on their dreams. And uh, that eventually led me into uh, a, a deeper focus on sleep. It's, it's virtually impossible to segregate sleep and dreams as, as much as we try to in our lives and, and even professionally. That led me um, back to Arizona where I had gone to school and, and I opened a sleep clinic, a sleep center at a facility here called Canyon Ranch. Uh, it, it's a world-renowned health spa and uh, ran that for about a dozen years. So the reason I bring that up is I had an opportunity to, to look at and study sleep and uh, treat sleep clinically, work with people with their sleep concerns um, in an alternative health setting. Uh, and this is always something that's drawn me. I, I think our conventional, the sort of standard medical approach to sleep uh, is, is, is absolutely essential, but it's also insufficient. It, it just doesn't really completely help us understand sleep, uh, nor does it offer solutions to, to the most serious sleep problems in, in an effective way. So my work um, for the past 25, close to 30 years, has been focused on alternative, complementary and alternative approaches, what we call integrative medicine approaches to sleep and dreams. Um, one of the best known physicians in the United States, uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, uh, is the director of the department I work in. It's the Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, we have um, teaching programs now that reach out to over 50 medical schools, um, teaching this approach that encourages a, a scientifically based integration of bringing together of the best of, of, that science has to offer, along with um, alternative approaches, which include a focus on nutrition, um, a, a focus on activity or exercise, uh, and a very critical focus on, on what we call body-mind factors, the influence of, of the mind, the brain, on sleep. And lastly, uh, in my work, I would say as important as all of this, and this again is a slippery term, is considering the spiritual dimensions of sleep. Sleep is not simply a mechanical process. Um, in fact, the brain does not sleep. We can study reflections of sleep in the brain. But when it comes right down to it, we sleep. It's, it's a human experience. And as important as understanding the physiology, the medicine, the objective science of sleep, it's equally important to really understand and come to terms with our personal relationship with sleep. I saw one thing that you wrote, and it's about REM, so rapid eye movement stage of sleep, is actually like shutting down the computer to, give it, to allow it to reboot or, or allow it to refresh in a way. Mm. 
Could we touch yes. on that? Because that that's often a lot of us don't allow ourselves to get to that stage or into that deeper element of sleep. And maybe to give our, our audience an idea of what, what that is as well, what REM is. The, the relationship of sleep to dreams is a little bit like the relationship of water to food. We need both. Our REM stands for rapid eye movement, and it refers to that time uh, during the sleep cycle. It's a repeated period uh, during which our dreaming becomes most evident. Um, in summary, we do most of our deep sleep in the first third of the night, uh, and we do most of our dream or REM sleep in the latter third of the night. Um, my, my greatest concern today in, in, in my professional work and in, in my life, actually, um, is, is that there's strong evidence that we are, we meaning the Western world, we are at least as dream deprived as we are sleep deprived. Uh, there's, there's strong reason to believe that we're actually losing more dream time than we are losing sleep time. And dreaming is critical in so many ways. Um, we, we know that it supports creativity. Uh, as important, we know that dreaming is strongly associated with memory formation. People who don't dream well don't learn well. They, they, they don't uh, take to heart, if you will, the things that they've, they've studied, um, been exposed to during the day. In fact, what goes on in REM sleep um, is parallel to what goes on in our digestive system. You might know in recent years, there's been a trend toward looking at the, the belly, at, at the, the digestive process as a second brain. It's called the second brain. The reason for this is we've discovered that many of the neurotransmitters that operate in the central nervous system in the brain are present in our gut. And, and it makes sense that, that y your belly needs to have a certain kind of intelligence because we ship all kinds of material to it. You know, we send all kinds of stuff down there, some of it nourishing and healthy, some of it questionable. And then the gut has to make decisions about everything it will keep, uh, what it will filter through, and what it will excrete. And this is simple, but these are very critical decisions about what the gut will decide to make a part of the self. You know, it's going to keep th these nourishing elements. It's going to sift through and excrete these other elements. What, it, what the gut keeps literally becomes a part of us, our energy system and, and even our physicality. Now, the brain during REM sleep does something very similar. What it does is it, it metaphorically chews on, it swallows, it digests all of the experiences that we've consumed during that waking day. So what I mean by that is in an average day, we're exposed to a lot of information, a lot of encounters, a lot of thoughts, things we read and see and hear and taste and smell. All of those billions of bits, if you will, of information are kind of stacked in there. And at night during REM sleep, the brain, we might say the mind, the spirit decides of everything we've been exposed to, what it will keep and what it will sift, uh, filter out. When I say what it will keep, um, what that means is that the brain decides what it will consolidate as memory. So in, in essence, during REM sleep, uh, we are remade. You know, we, we incorporate this, these new experiences. They get placed, they get integrated within our being. When REM sleep fails, when we don't get sufficient quantity or quality of REM sleep, it's a little bit like a psychological constipation. So we're taking in all this information, but we're not digesting it. We're taking in all these experiences, but we're not processing them. And what, what's been fascinating for me uh, for, for 20 years is we know that clinical depression, people who are clinically depressed, have damaged REM sleep. And it, I, I've believed for a long time that um, the way to heal depression is about healing our dreaming, that, that, that healthy dreaming. Just as often in healing an illness in the body, we want to, we want to heal our digestion so that we can, uh, we can assimilate healthy nourishment to build our immune system and so on. We need to heal our dreaming process 
to heal our minds. It's really interesting. When I was just thinking how, you know, we're moving towards a knowledge-based economy. So we're moving away from agriculture and manufacturing, and that's been done more and more by artificial intelligence and automation. And if we're moving towards a knowledge-based economy, we're we're calling on our brains a hell of a lot more than we ever did before. But yet we're living a very Western life in that. I remember reading about Eastern philosophies that the Western man, looking back on the Western man goes, the Western man spends all his time making money and accumulating wealth and then retires and then spends all his money on his health because he's yes. done such damage to himself over that right. period of time. And when I read your work and, and saw the great content on your website, I was like, this is a huge problem. This is an epidemic that's going through the world. And then in typical Western ways, we, we, we go to the cheat mode. So, for example, people want to lose weight. They take pills. They don't actually go to the gym and change their lifestyle. We do the same with sleep. We reach out for wine, sleeping pills. We, some people reach out for marijuana. We, we actually, instead of actually fixing the root of the problem, we try to cover up the cracks with a new lick of paint. And I'd love some, some touch points for our audience, Ruben, if you would, on how to fix that and some, some tips, you know, to get there. Yeah. You know, when, when it comes to um, creating healthy sleep and dreams, um, essentially we're, we're looking at undamming a river. Uh, the body, the mind, the spirit wants to sleep. It wants to dream. We don't need to force that. We need to look into our lives, into our minds, into our lifestyles. We need to look at our environment and determine what it, what is blocking, what is inadvertently damming up the natural flow of sleep. So let me touch on sleep and then I'll touch on dreaming. Um, there are two essential parts to healing our sleep. One of them is environmental, and the other one is psychological or psychospiritual. So environmentally, um, we human beings over the past 10,000 years or so have moved indoors. We used to live outside. Uh, there's a great story in Australia where the government created a housing project for the Aboriginal population there. And... Um, uh, this is a population that was accustomed to, to living uh, in, out, out in the world. And uh, so they put them in these homes. And, and what they did was they moved into and lived in the backyard. They, re they really couldn't stand being cooped up. We're so accustomed to it. But, but this is what I, what I call excessive domestication. So most of us spend much too much time indoors. Indoors, we have poor lighting during the day. We have a flat temperature rhythm, which is very different than what we get outside. And we're not exposed to the natural circadian energies of light and dark, of, of dusk and dawn. That has a profound effect on our biology and our psychology. Um, one of the very best treatments that we have for insomnia, for, for people who can't fall asleep or stay asleep, is actually a simple treatment. It involves sending them to the country, sending people on camping trips for a week. Uh, but the, the, the caveat there is we need to surgically extract their electronic devices. And this is the difficult part is taking, you know, um, all the, uh, taking all the phones and things away from people. So what happens then is, of course, people are exposed to the natural rhythms um, of, of light and darkness. Um, in the U.S., we, um, we, in recent years, we've coined a term called nature deficit disorder. And so environmentally, nature deficit disorder is what contributes to poor sleep. Psychologically, uh, there's a whole other critical piece to this. Um, there's a beautiful poem by uh, an American poet uh, named Mary Oliver called Sleeping in the Forest. And it's an exquisite poem that captures the, the, the psychological and spiritual essence of sleep. There's that image, too, of sleeping in the forest, on the ground. I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to do this, but uh, we do need to reinstate some of the qualities of that natural environment. But she also talks about uh, falling asleep and rising and falling. She says, all night I rose and I fell. And... Um, when we look at the psychology of going to sleep, there are two parts to it. One is we, we need to essentially submit the body to bed. 
the, the word bed in English etymologically is linked to the word garden bed, which is very interesting. Again, it takes us back to this notion of the ground, of being grounded. So the body essentially, metaphorically, needs to go down. It needs to submit to gravity. We need to let the body go. Um, the difficulty with that in our world today is that so many of us are suffering from a condition we call hyperarousal. Hyperarousal um, essentially suggests that, that the level of our waking is too high pitched. Now, most of us know that when we go to sleep, we go through layers of sleep. We go through deeper and deeper layers or deeper levels, the stage one, stage two, stage three, and so on. But we forget that we can also be awake at different levels. And we measure this with EEG, with electroencephalography. So we can be in, in, in relaxed waking, which is alpha. We can be in low beta, which is waking somewhat energized. But many people are in mid to high range beta. They're essentially buzzing. This is a buzzing brain. You see this in the world where people are walking fast, talking fast, thinking fast, pushing through their lives. So that kind of velocity and acceleration makes it very hard to settle down at night. The antidote to that, and we put the body down, the antidote to that, to hyperarousal, is pretty simple. It is humility. It's humility. Hyperarousal is a kind of cognitive arrogance. And in fact, the word humility comes from the English word humus, which again takes us back to the earth. There has to be this, this willingness to surrender our being to the bed, to the garden bed, to the earth, to let ourselves go down. When that happens, when the body goes down, if you will, when our physicality goes down, the mind rises. Now, in many traditions, both Western and Eastern, there's a common notion that when we go to sleep, the soul leaves the body. We can use a lot of different language about this, but, but again, metaphorically, as the body goes down, the, the spirit, if you will, rises. And this takes us into REM sleep. This takes us into the dream. Now, how do we heal our dreams? Um, essentially, it's about undamming the river of dreams. What interferes with dreaming is so common in our lifestyle. Excessive alcohol consumption interferes with REM sleep. Many commonly used medications, many psychiatric medications, most antidepressants, most anti-anxiety agents significantly interfere with REM sleep. A lot of sleeping pills, ironically, interfere with REM sleep. There's a category of drugs we call anticholinergics, um, most commonly used for allergies, for example. They interfere with REM sleep. And when you add to that, that uh, so many people have sleep apnea, where they, they can't get into deeper REM sleep because of an obstruction of their breathing, and then many, many more people have what we call middle insomnia, where they're waking up in the middle of the night and they can't get back to sleep. Those folks are not losing sleep, they're losing dreams. It's reminiscent of um, Shakespeare's Hamlet and, and the line about uh, to sleep perchance to dream. A lot of people, I believe, awaken because they're not comfortable in what goes on in that dream world. So we, we have to be willing to look at what blocks our dreams and, and really address those dream thieves as importantly we have to be willing to reconnect with the dreaming self. Uh, I believe that, that our identity, our waking self-identity, is a, is a critical but actually very limited part of who we are. I think there's so much more that makes us up that is really difficult to, to capture or contain in the space of waking consciousness. Most highly creative people um, most artists I've worked with, musicians, uh, dancers, really creative people, find a, a very personal way of tapping into this larger consciousness. And so what we call the dream at night can actually be present during the day. Um, uh, it's interesting. We have a lot of research in which we, we study the way people perceive in their dreams. And I've written about this. I call this dream eyes. Dream eyes, for example, are non-judgmental. Uh, we can look at anything with dream eyes 
and uh, we accept it. When we wake up and we look back at the dream with waking world eyes, we frequently will react with, oh my God, that's so weird. But the more we dream, the more we exercise those dream eyes, the more we are able to use them in waking life. And uh, the evidence suggests that that makes us more creative. It also opens our heart to a more spiritual life. Now, this is independent of religion. Um, what it does is, is it creates, a, it opens a door to a direct relationship with mystery, which most of us screen out in our daily lives. I remember reading about the great David Bohm, and he used to go into a, basically a silent room and focus on a problem and, and, well, focus on a solution for a problem that he identified. And it got me thinking that, you know, you hear that this can be done in sleep, but you also you have to, obviously you have to do what you said here and create the right conditions for that sleep. But like to get a little bit deeper, how can, how can we do that? Because so many people have problems or, you know, they want to implant affirmations before they go asleep. What's your, th what's your thoughts on those kind of things? It, it, it's an interesting question. Um, we live in a world where there's a, a widespread, um, pretty rigid presumption that sleep, uh, sleep and dreams are, are essentially functional. And we opened our conversation with talking about how, how important sleep is in the world of productivity, in the world of business and so on. And it's absolutely true. Um, but again, there's a presumption that the only reason we sleep is to make us better waking people. Now, that might sound strange as, as uh, you hear me say that, um, but th this is where we're, you know, we're, we're encouraged to sleep by professionals because it will make us, um, it, it'll give us more energy during the day. It will improve our immune systems. It will improve our memory. Uh, it will improve our productivity. It will improve our, our athletic performance. It goes on and on and on. In fact, all, you know, every time we ask sleep or a research question like sleep, can you help with immunity? It answers in the affirmative. So we know sleep is sleep supports waking life. But the assumption that the only reason we sleep is to be better waking people, I believe, is misguided. Um, th there, there is really interesting um, literature that goes back thousands of years uh, out of Eastern traditions, uh, out of Hindu yogic traditions, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, there are Western writings about this, uh, notably Rudolf Steiner. Uh, there, there's a lot of writing that suggests that, that sleep is not just a servant of waking life, that in, in our deepest sleep, we actually access our deepest self. It's a spiritual rendezvous, if you will. It's a return home. There's an old, uh, a beautiful Beatles song uh, from the early 70s called Golden Slumbers. Uh, it was a lullaby written originally by Thomas Decker 300 years before. And, and the lyric runs, once there was a way to get back home, once there was a way to get back home, sleep pretty darling. So it was understood historically that sleep was not just necessary to make us better waking people, that it really was an, also an end in and of itself we can begin to look at sleep as part of a spiritual path, a spiritual pursuit. Yeah, because we're, we're way more holistic, or we aim to be in this world. There's a, certainly a huge shift in humanity. It may appear like dissatisfaction with the way things were, and we came out of the agrarian and the industrial ages, and now we're coming into a more place where we're actually questioning things. And I just think, I mean, your work is of its time now. And we see the rise of, of wellness and the rise of uh, um, mindfulness and, and so many elements and Reiki and, you know, holistic treatments are now actually yes. being preferred over medical treatment. As a compliment, not, not in lieu of. Not in lieu of, yeah, yeah. Compliment to medical treatment, yes. But it's like what you said, we are nature deprived. I leave my house every day. I go to the gym first thing in the morning. I get up at 6 a.m., and I hear the birds sing, and I, I actually always think to myself, that is nature's alarm clock. That dawn chorus is yes. actually the time everybody should be up. But, but what we do instead is we sleep through that, then we sit in traffic for an hour or more. And then, <laughs> and then the other end of the day, like when my kids go to bed at like 7.38, is the, the birds are almost saying goodnight at that time as well. And it's like this natural yeah. 
that's the time we should be operating in. Those are the two two really most profound times of day. If you're looking just at the world, um, these are hemispheric changes that occur during dusk and dawn. And I imagine um, it's similar uh, there as it is here. Um, most people in, in, in my world um, experience what we call rush hour during dusk and dawn. When these, these remarkable transitions happening in light, um, people are in a hurry to get up and get going and get their kids to school and go to work. When the sun is setting, likewise, they're returning home and they're in a hurry. But if, I, if I could put in a plug, uh, I actually uh, I teach in Europe every summer. Um, uh, I, I teach at three yoga centers, uh, one in France, one in Germany, and uh, one in Austria. The, the Germany center is in Munich, but the, the center in France and the center in Austria are uh, in beautiful, beautiful, natural locations. So uh, these are listed on my website if people are interested. Of course, there's so much more to this sleep story and, and healing sleep, but if folks are interested in that, they can find those retreats on my website. In France? It's it's near Orléans, in a, a beautiful uh, uh, natural forested area, and near Orléans. May I touch on something, Ruben, as well? You know, you have children, the children wake up during the night, and people are absolutely sleep-deprived. So the pattern is usually you get married couple of years later you might have children if you have two children one or the other you end up going into a different bed every night and basically you're dream deprived but you're also sleep deprived and i wanted to ask you about that like so staying in the same bed as your partner has to have a positive effect on your relationship going getting into the more spiritual side of things yes you know historically we had in the western world we had what was called the family bed it's just been in relatively recent times that, that people created separate bedrooms and, and what we call solo sleep. Um, the anthropological evidence suggests that we're actually meant to sleep socially, that sleep is a social event. But here's the thing. Um, we have been unnecessarily frightened about awakening. So let me say this carefully. The problem is not waking up at night. The problem is getting back to sleep. It's actually perfectly normal to wake up during the night, even a few times. It's perfectly normal. Maybe we get up and use the restroom or we wake up and, and uh, you know, we turn over, pull the covers, or we wake up with a child. Uh, mothers in particular have been, become so frightened, uh, unfortunately. Um, there's really strong evidence that women are biologically programmed to get significantly more deep sleep than men, which means Mother Nature anticipated a woman struggling with sleep during pregnancy, um, around childbirth and early childhood. Um, by the way, in my field, we consider pregnancy a sleep disorder. It's just really difficult to sleep with, you know, with that sure. in your belly. Sure. But, sure. but it, tur it turns out that, again, Mother Nature anticipated it. Women needn't be frightened. A, a woman can go for a stretch of time with relatively light sleep. In fact, we believe that, that uh, Mother Nature expects the mother to be tuned into the child. We talk about mother's ear, you know, uh, to be able to listen, to hear, even get a sense of the baby intuitively. So um, it needn't be a problem. Uh, uh, again, and, and uh, children will often self-regulate. They will, uh, at some point, if you have a family bed, they will let you know when they're ready to sleep alone. And it may be moving onto a mattress uh, away from the bed or it might be moving into another room. So I think we've lost touch with that. Years ago, there was a, a strong, um, unnecessary move, in my opinion, to encourage mothers and fathers to put babies uh, in a separate room. Uh, I think there's, a, there's, there's some interesting history to that. But um, it, it needn't be a problem if, if, uh, if you're waking up at night uh, – there's, there's no need to fall into a judgment of that, which people do. They wake up and they go, oh, damn, I'm up. I'm not going to sleep. This is terrible. What wakes us up is not typically what keeps us up. What keeps us up is our psychological reaction, our negative judgment of the awakening. And if we can let go of that and not judge the awakening, it's fine to get up at night, bits here and there. But to get back to sleep is what we want to aim for. So people reach out, obviously, for sleep aids, valerian, melatonin, for example. What, what's your view on that? So sleep aids, um, by the way, the, the physician I work with, doc, Dr. Andrew Weil, just last week published a, a new book. He has many books out. It's called Mind Over Meds, 
And there's a chapter in that book that I, I helped him with uh, on, on sleep aids. It's called sleep aids. So we're talking about a whole range of things from uh, pres- pres- very strong prescription medications all the way down to herbs or botanicals and melatonin. So it's complex. Generally speaking, sleeping pills prescription and over-the-counter conventional sleeping pills, in my opinion, are not a good idea. Um, having said that, I, I think there are good alternatives, um, and I do believe melatonin can be very useful, but it's widely misunderstood. Uh, most of the products on the market, in my opinion, are useless. The way that they're formulated, the dosage is too high, and most of them are instant release, which means they will spike up in your blood and brain at the beginning of the night, and then quiet. Uh, if someone's going to take melatonin, by the way, I, I don't know if it's available over the counter in Ireland. No, it's, per, it's prescription, but but prescription. I've, he- I've heard of a lot of children being given melatonin to help them, Not for that, example. Yeah. Right. So w- with children, there's some evidence that melatonin might help autistic children, but I would uh, work closely with a knowledgeable pediatrician before doing that. Uh, but melatonin can be very helpful with adults. Most of us in our world are so overexposed to light at night that it's been whipping the pineal gland, also known as the third eye, the pineal gland, which produces, naturally produces melatonin. So we see a reduction in melatonin over time. Uh, I'll share with you, I, I, um, I'm 67 years old. I have been taking a small dose of melatonin nightly for 27 years. And I don't do it because I I have sleep concerns. I sleep quite well. I do it because I think, like everyone else in my world, I'm overexposed to light at night as much as I try to to modulate that. And so I take it. I also take other vitamins and supplements. Um, That's my, my personal decision. But I think if someone wants to consider melatonin, they need to get informed. Unfortunately, a lot of physicians don't understand it. There is a prescription form of melatonin available in Europe. Um, my opinion is that it's problematic because it's not time released. We need a time released or sustained released formulation. They are available over the counter in the U.S. Yeah. So, so the screens, Ruben, as well. We're all checking our phone and checking Facebook and all these kind of things. Ju- oftentimes, just before we go to bed. Well, there, there are two problems with it. One is the the light that comes out of screens has a, a strong blue wavelength, and that's specifically the kind of light that sends a message through the eye to the pineal to tell it to shut down melatonin production. So even little bits of the, that kind of light. The second is it tends to excite us. Um, who was it? Pascal once said, uh, um, there's nothing more frightening to men than to, to be alone in a room. And, and this is part of the transition to sleep. No matter what we're doing, we need to be willing to be with ourselves. And uh, if we've not spent time with ourselves during the day and we have a, a backup, if you will, a buildup of um, thoughts and feelings and encounters and experiences and emotions that we have in process, then all of that stuff will, will just show up the moment we turn out the last lamp on the bedstand. So people keep trying to keep their brains busy and, and it backfires. Um, so I think dialing down the light, tuning the lights down at night, an hour or two before bed. In fact, there's now a, a, a wonderful technology. You can buy light bulbs that are called low blue lights. And uh, I have these in my bedroom and bathroom. So I can turn on the lights, but the brain doesn't read it as light. It actually reads it as darkness. Wow. It won't suppress melatonin. I'm not sure if these products are available in Europe. I'd be surprised if they're not. Yeah, that's but fantastic. These on the web, yeah. That's yeah. fantastic advice. And and last po- point is consciousness, because you mentioned this, and, <laughs> I, and I'm a huge believer also in this, and almost accessing a collective consciousness. When you get control of your mind in a certain way, that you can access a, a higher consciousness or a, or a collective consciousness, as, if you will. Would yes. you mind expanding on that? Because I know I know it's it's a lot of your work as well. Yeah. So you know, um, it, it's when you think about it, it's odd that, that virtually all of us refer to us ourselves with the same word. I call myself I. You call yourself I. The listeners, we all call ourselves I. And for most of us, the part of us that we call I is the waking self. 
It's just one small part of consciousness. It's usually associated with the ego. So from a sleep perspective, the part of me that I call I is incapable of sleep. It's the waking self. It's incapable of sleep. It, it can walk me to the edge of the waters of sleep, but it can't swim. We need to learn to let go of that. When we do, and, and this is part of the natural expansive process of both sleeping and dreaming, our sense of self is very different. This is why dreams can seem so weird. I can be me in the dream. I can be you. I, I, can, I can be watching myself in the dream. I can be uh, other people. So our, our identity can expand in the dream. We live in a world where we have segregated, separated and segregated sleeping and dreaming and waking. These are the three primary forms of consciousness. We keep them very separate. What happens in, I believe, healthy life, healthy sleep and dreams is they begin to come together. We begin to experience elements of the dream world when we're awake. We begin to open our hearts and minds to this expansive consciousness. So the better we dream at night, the more we can be dreamy in a positive sense during the day. But as importantly, we can actually begin to feel elements of sleep during the day. And, and that shows up as a, a beautiful, subtle, but powerful sense of serenity. Uh, sleep, in my opinion, deep sleep is identical to what spiritual teachers have been speaking about for eons. Deep sleep is inner peace. It's given to us by grace if we're willing to go there every night. So when we reconnect with these states of consciousness and we reintegrate them, I call this the United States of Consciousness. Oh, uh, it's, oh. it's not about pulling them together. It's about recognizing the ways in which we unconsciously segregate them. So we, we begin to experience a whole new way of being. The sense of self, the sense of I now includes. It's just bigger, it's broader. Uh, it doesn't define oneself uh, in contrast to others. There's a beautiful line in the Hindu scriptures that says, wherever there is other, there is fear. So there's less fear in life when we allow elements of sleeping and dreaming to, 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 be, to imbue, um, to penetrate into our waking day. And this is, this is in my mind, whole consciousness. Yeah, and that has to lead to better creativity because people, companies are craving creative people, different thinkers, they need to almost be allowed time to regenerate their thoughts. Because if you're a very mental intensive person and maybe work very much on creativity or even strategy, you need almost time to regenerate that brain power and put it back in. Absolutely. And, and one last thing is power naps, because I know people are going to go, I wish you asked about power naps, because you read a lot of stuff about this and, you know, all the right. The big tech giants have chill out rooms and for yes, which, yes. which barely anybody ever uses, but, but they're there anyway. <laughs> it could actually lead to better productivity. There's no question there's research on this. Um, napping is very natural. Uh, in fact, all mammals are programmed to nap. Whether we've had a good night's sleep or not, there's an interesting circadian drop in body temperature, core body temperature, that happens in the middle of our waking day for most of us around two o'clock, give or take. And uh, when the core body temperature drops, we're, we're pulled into sleep. And again, this is independent of how much we slept that night or the night before. Um, so napping is healthy. It reduces blood pressure. Um, it, it, uh, it increases productivity. The uh, Yogi Berra, who was, was a, a well-known um, American uh, baseball player um, who had a, an, an incredible sense of humor, he used to say, I take a two-hour nap every day from one to five. <laughs> nice. And what that did, it, it highlighted something else. I, I do think that one of the great benefits, unspoken benefits of napping, and a benefit of good sleep and good dreaming is it improves your sense of humor. Now, maybe that's associated with creativity, that lightheartedness, that expansiveness, that, that vulnerability to life, that openness, I think is very, very critical. And by the way, um, we, we believe the best nap doesn't run two hours. An ideal nap time is approximately 20 minutes situated approximately in the middle of your waking day. Yeah, because and, and one last thing. So people, people have often said to me, oh, well, the way you do a power nap is you have an espresso. And then you go for 20 minutes because it takes 20 minutes for the espresso to kick in and it'll wake yeah, you up. Yes, it's true. It's, it's true. true, is it? Okay, wow. Yeah.
Yeah, and, and I mean that's uh, espresso coffee is a whole other topic. Um, again, it's 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 never as simple as we'd like it to be. But there's nothing wrong with drinking coffee if you drink the right amount at the right time. It can be a huge problem if you're drinking too much at the wrong time. And and wine, for example, Ruben. So people think, oh, I go home after a hard days of work, I'll have a wine, but they often have half a bottle. What's your thoughts on that one? Right. Well, there, there's clear research on this. First of all, women metabolize alcohol at about half the efficiency that men do. So um, if she's having a glass of wine, it's the equivalent of his having two glasses of wine. Now, there's individual variation, but alcohol uh, ideally is taken earlier and absolutely with food. Um, people who take a nightcap or drink excessively later into the evening and closer to bedtime, there's no question that that will help them fall asleep, but shortly afterwards it will compromise the quality of their sleep, and even more so, it will wreck their dreaming. Wow, brilliant. So uh, I'm not a teetotaler. I think a glass of wine is fine, but one has to be, uh, uh, one has to be moderate in the use of alcohol. Brilliant. Well, Ruben, it's been a, an absolute pleasure talking to you. And people can find out the information about your camps in um, Europe on the website, drnaiman.com. D-R-N-A-I-M-A-N.com. If you Google my first name, R-U-B-I-N, and the word sleep, uh, it'll take you to my website. Well, I'm going yeah. to link to all the information and great. your book, Hush, as well, which is uh, fantastic. And there's, there's some great material on your site about all a lot of the topics and deeper into some of them. Dr. Ruben Nyman, thank you for joining us. Great, thank you very much. It, it's a pleasure. So now on the Innovation Show, we welcome John Murphy, CEO and co-founder of 8 West Consulting. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks very much, Aidan. Great to have you on the show. And I saw you speaking recently at uh, the IT at Cork event, and you had a lot of interesting things to say, so I thought we'd follow up and have a chat. So uh, without further ado, tell us about yourself and the business. I, I suppose I've been in the software business in Ireland for maybe 30 years now. If we just say that rather quickly, it'll pass quickly. <laughs> uh, I would have started off uh, my time working in core computers, which is actually still around in Cork, a large software company. And then I moved into uh, digital in Galway and digital equipment corporation in Galway. I was there for nine years. I was on the software side of it. I saw a very interesting, I, I suppose, uh, company. It was a very interesting and very challenging place to work at the time as well, a very dynamic uh, organization. And um, it was part of that whole um, organization, really, that had a, both a hardware component in Galway, it had a hardware component and a uh, large component in, in Clonmel as well, as well as the software center in Galway. Uh, eventually, uh, hardware um, uh, was shut down uh, in Ireland, uh, Clamel first and then Galway, and then software um, is actually still there under different ownership, but uh, some people that I've worked with are actually still in that organization. Uh, so I moved then from, from digital to Seagate, which was a, kind of a rapid startup in Clonmel. I was one of the first in that organization and one of the last out of it. It, it uh, lasted two and a half years in that sort of experiment. And then uh, moved to Cork. There was an opportunity to um, head up a small software development shop for a U.S. insurance company that was looking around for a place to set up uh, um, a kind of offshore development shop. It was 1998, uh, prior to Y2K. Uh, things were hotting up for resources in the States. I think the unemployment rate in the, the States back then was about 4 or 5%, similar to where it's uh, lying right now. And the guys needed to get uh, resources. And the uh, CEO of that U.S. Uh, insurance company, it was a D-Care Dental Insurance Company, was a, a Mayo man and was looking to set up somewhere in Ireland. So uh, set up in Cork with seven people and um, kind of grew the organization um, uh, very quickly. Uh, my, uh, kind of my, my business partner now, Eamon Franklin, who's the co-CEO of 8 West, uh, he and I, uh, worked to kind of a, a very interesting kind of a business model within the company. Yes, we wanted to be a fantastic uh, multinational subsidiary for a parent company, but we also wanted to grow the business to go beyond just being a multinational subsidiary and move it into being a competitive software company that would go out and compete for uh, other software development contracts, um, both in the US and in Europe. Um, and our, our parent company gave us that uh, support and that charter to go away and do that. And we kind of grew the company substantially. Uh, to the extent over a number of years, the, the D-Care company was purchased by Anthem. Um, Anthem would be about Fortune 33, uh, does, has a revenue 
in the region of about 80 billion a year. Huge insurance company in the United States. And it purchased um, DCARE plus, you know, at the time it was DSI in Cork in, um, uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, so, um, again, the organization continued to grow. We got over 100 people, 120, 130, and just a lot of core software development. And Eamon and I really looked to kind of grow the company to be a very strong software engineering shop going after large scale uh, software development projects and insurance or in, you know, in critical infrastructure systems, uh, such as large e-commerce uh, applications as well. So um, we, we then got to the stage where um, we had discussions with Anthem on um, a- acquiring the company. And we spent uh, two years going through an MBO process that we thought would only take about six months. And uh, it always takes longer and it always costs a little bit more. And uh, as of January the 1st this year, then um, Eamon and I took uh, uh, ownership of this company and we rebranded it 8 West Consulting. We're currently at about 194 people, um, pretty much everybody based in Cork, still focused on strong object oriented uh, development, or development in C Sharp and in Java. And uh, in more recent years, we moved from being just a full kind of services company doing critical infrastructure and critical system development um, into product development as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you see ourselves now five, six months into the, uh, the new venture and it really feels a very fresh, uh, very fresh company and everybody's invigorated that we've got a kind of a new goal and new charter kind of moving forward. Yeah, it really does. When you have that kind of refresh every company needs it but john i thought it was interesting you were talking about the platforms the type of platforms you, you build could you tell us a bit about that it's very hard to say like is there a vertical that you guys in eight west go after so well, there are things that we're really very very good at but we don't really limit ourselves to any particular vertical we're we're software engineer i'm a software engineer by trade Eamon's a software engineer by trade so we our oxygen really are, would be you know very complex systems or mission critical systems and we've got some fantastic architects and and lead developers here that we can assemble around solving uh, technical uh, problems but some of the very large systems that we have built would be um, the, some of the largest uh, e-commerce platforms for for clients in the states and and in the EMEA we do very little work in in Ireland most of our our business is in the United States um, so uh, as, as well as the, those very online systems, mission critical systems, then we've built uh, very large scale claims adjudication, benefit management systems that deal with the complexities of the US uh, healthcare um, legislation. And um, you're, you're dealing with, with millions of transactions, millions of transactions a day, and uh, certainly our e-commerce platforms, um, which we built pretty much from the, the ground up in many cases, are you know pretty mission critical to the organizations that we've assembled them for and they're built in again as i mentioned earlier on they're built in the java development platform or as they're built in um and c sharp but they would be very very large scale systems and like very the, the, the largest clients that we would work for um uh, in the united states and the mea um, are at the forefront of the internet technology and the forefront of the the threats that exist in many organ to many organizations in the states so um, and one of the, the topics I think we discussed uh, last week in, in talking about the retention and storage of personal healthcare information and personally identifiable information are a set of kind of um, development practices and uh, techniques and really coding regimes that need to go with all that. It, gone are the days where we are just kind of spinning up a website and kind of putting it out on the internet and uh, hoping that it doesn't crash. You're now building you know, digital storefronts for very large scale organizations, which is really is their window and is their door to the internet? And is, is there a door to, to potential threat vectors as well from, um, uh, you know, individuals who are motivated to cause damage, either reputational damage or state actors or even competitors. So there's a very, very strong focus now um, in the types of applications that we're building on making sure that the correct security practices are in place in a development organization. So, so for us as well as, you know, we would have, as I mentioned, close to 200 people here and pretty much everybody working on development projects. We would have um, continuous integration environments, which are very standard in, in most um, agile software development companies. But as part of all that, of course, we have continuous code coverage and continuous code quality projects 
our processes being applied to all our code before it's been checked in. And then, of course, we've got um, passive scanning of code, dynamic scanning of code, penetration testing of code. So you, you have a, a huge umbrella of security um, practices that are being applied to the code that we are developing. As, as most organizations, large scale organizations now view themselves already as being penetrated potentially by, um, by hackers. Uh, a lot of the systems, even internal systems now, are being built to the same ex security standards as external systems. So this this puts um, uh, this puts a slightly different uh, perspective, really, I suppose, on how you're actually building your applications. Because traditionally, in the past, if you're building an internal system for accounts, you you were always assured that you know was, that security was a hundred hundred percent watertight within the IT department or within that cabinet or within that computer room. You know, common, common security uh, posture now would be that you view the the uh, system has already been breached in some way, and you try to secure all your internal systems as well. So you bring all that that security uh, development experience that we have from building our large online systems, and we apply that now onto internal systems as well. So when we find ourselves working in these these large scale uh, development projects, it brings a couple of of well just uh, acceptable characteristics of those projects as well one being that uh, our software company is audited very regularly you know by our clients because our clients themselves are are in um, the insurance world and they themselves are being audited and held to account by various state and, um, and federal authorities in the united states so so we would have to undergo audits from um, either in our customers independent auditors and you're probably looking I would host, uh, host, I suppose, yes, I'd host a, an auditing team at least once a quarter coming on site here from a customer that goes through every single policy and procedure that we have within our organization. In some cases, we'll install some software and hardware to check that, that our security, that our network is, uh, is secure. They may even take a developer's PC and break it down to make sure that it has everything that we say it has. And then we'll look at uh, logs to ensure that we are doing what we are say that we are doing. So you, you have all that that kind of uh, external um, exposure, uh, you know, that when you're in that business, you do expect to be uh, audited and you do need to be able to kind of come out of those audits um, in, a, in a pretty tight manner. Uh, so the, the, it, it's, it's part and parcel really of the type of uh, business environment that we find ourselves in. Like, you know, if you grow up and if you grow up as a software company and you start winning those critical projects, um, your customers would expect you to have would expect you to have uh, software development and security practices that are absolutely tier one and standard and as good as anything else out in the industry. So you really need to, you, you, you know, at one stage you, you try to get everybody as innovative as possible and you got to support all that, but then you've got to secure the environment as much as possible as well. So it's uh, not quite security isn't a, a, a counterculture really for the uh, for innovative, you know, startup mentalities, but it's something that needs to be kind of embedded for the very start, understanding that you are responsible for systems that process, you know, uh, personally identifiable information or private healthcare information or PCI and DSS information. So with that comes um, some pretty st strange, and you're moving beyond just even data protection, what data protection means, because the, in, in, certainly in the case of the US, the uh, the legislation is probably even tighter than it is in Europe. Um, so it's just an interesting aspect of the type of things that we do. When you have this kind of external auditor or the teams, as you say, coming in every so often, it, it makes you have to be at the top of your game because I, I heard that about 8West, that you know, security is a huge part of, of your offering as well as the expert code that you, you, you work on. But um, it, it raised a really interesting one, John, because we talked about this before was data regards health tech, for example. People would struggle to see why somebody would want to know Aidan McCullen's health data versus my credit card data. And you expanded on this, and I think it'd be really interesting to tell our audience about that. Yeah, there's a, a couple of, of different aspects as to why this information would be useful to external actors. So if you're looking at the... the uh, probably the most tame would be that people have just got criminal intent to do damage, um, which would be one. They're just coming in to do damage to install some ransomware um, on your server. 
and then you know uh, try to exhort it, uh, exert as much money as possible out of you. Uh, then it could be an impersonation. Um, then it could be that they're seeking to inject some other data, some false data into the data set that you'd have stored in your data warehouse. And, and another aspect then, depending on the type of company that um, you are and the type of clients that you are. So if you're an insurance company and you're, you've got, uh, you're covering uh, a lot of um, maybe employees or groups that are in the defense sector or maybe in the State Department or maybe in some critical in industry uh, sector, then you're, you're seeking uh, potentially as a potentially as a state actor, you're looking to kind of build up your profile of the individuals that work in those areas. Um, so it's part of a kind of a longer game as you're looking to build up a profile and picture of the, the person, their claims, their family, trying to seek if there's some sort of um, potentially damaging or, or um, deeply private um, healthcare information that they may be able to use and exploit. So uh, it, it's around the utility of the information and turning the information that they would retrieve upon you or upon me and making it into something that would somebody may be able to have some leverage over. Um, and that's certainly at one particular aspect of, of the hacking at the state level and the very, very large organizations uh, that are involved in the state sector would have a, a lot of that data. Yeah, and a lot of this data would be gathered and sold on the on the dark web. But I was thinking about this, like, and I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat here for a second. Fast forward 20 years from now, and you think about nanorobotics and, you know, targeted medication, for example. So, you know, if I have a certain disease that it can target a certain area that that disease is attacking, say it's cancer and it's in, in my shoulder, that the medication can actually target the shoulder with nano robotics that also mm -hmm. means that weaknesses can be attacked and that if people know my weaknesses or know i have a certain allergy or whatever it may be that they can come under attack that information has a utility to somebody and the utility could be that they will look to to perform some good that there's a there's an illness there and there's there's a cure for it or there's something that will in some way um, relieve some of the conditions associated with it or there could be the exact opposite to that so the, uh, we, we normally assume on the, the bright web, if we want to call it that, or on, on the, the, uh, this side of life that you and I live in, and most of, of your listeners would live in as well, that, that um, a lot of the, the research that has been done is for the, the betterment of, of the human condition and uh, humans in general and for society and, and progressing uh, progressive healthcare. Um, but there are also others that may have a totally different view of things, which are looking for particular weaknesses that may be exploited. So it's, it's um, yeah, PHI, private healthcare information, is something which has uh, to be really, really super closely guarded. And it's something that, that does need to be protected at, at all costs. And, and we as developers, you know, get exposed to that as well, of course, and we need to be absolutely sure that we're protecting ourselves and making sure that data is obfuscated all, at, um, at all times and just making sure that the software that we are building is to be as secure as possible and not as, it's not open to threat vectors. Now, you could say that, that um, you can produce uh, software that can be protected against the current threat vectors that are there. And certainly you need, need to probably refactor it on a regular basis to keep it up to speed. But um, the greatest threats in most organizations come from um, internal, uh, come from the internal network, where are either individual, individuals within the organization are motivated to, to do something illegal. And uh, that can be very uh, difficult to protect against. And it's interesting you say this, John, because I was thinking about if we're moving more and more towards an API economy, so every, data being Lego bricks that are interchangeable with different platforms or software. And, and then you have PSD2 in the banking sector where data becomes open, essentially. But then you have all these fintech companies. But a lot of the fintech companies, I mean, I would wager an, an awful lot, the majority, would not have near the experience that companies like 8West have of, of, of privacy and, you know, guarding, safeguarding that data availability and that in a way while they may have a great idea for a fintech startup they don't have the expertise in minding the the unbelievably sensitive information and data that's there 
Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I've gone through a no number of, um, uh, I've sat through them a number of data breach presentations and I've gone through actual data breach meetings um, with, with clients in the United States uh, in the healthcare sector. And they're incredibly serious, um, taken very, very seriously all the way up to the CEO gets involved in it because that's the way the legislation is, is directed and targeted in, in the United States. And, um, you know, I, I've seen organizations going from from very operational focus and suddenly there's a data breach and it's, it's like, uh, things get very, very serious very quickly. There's a whole set of processes and procedures and I've seen organizations um, take that, uh, take an approach, I suppose, really, that would surprise many people um, in Europe. And uh, I think it's something that needs to be taken incredibly seriously. And I think in the US, they do have their, their data breach policies and procedures through their HIPAA and high tech acts uh, at a pretty high operating level within the insurance companies and with all providers within the healthcare uh, sector in the United States. And uh, it's something that uh, they all take incredibly seriously. And as technology providers into that space as well, we ourselves have to take it incredibly seriously. So when somebody needs to come and do a, a tech audit for us for, you know, a, a security audit for a week, yep, absolutely open the doors to them because we, we will have connectivity, of course, through secure VPNs into their organizations. And, you know, we would potentially be a vector as well as being one of the many technology providers into large healthcare organizations. So we take our, our responsibility really, really seriously. So what does actually mean, you know, and you and I spoke about kind of developing software for customers in the United States and developing software for customers and solutions in, in Ireland. Well, in the United States for large scale customers, they'll understand that there's a cost to building super secure systems and what it means to be able to refactor your online solution on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis because it's a new threat vector or there's, there's a library that you've used, a hibernate library that you've used that you need to deprecate because um, it's come up on the watch list for, for some security flaw. Um, the, the, the same sensitivity, the same um, uh, maturity, technological maturity, understanding technology doesn't exactly exist in, in many European countries as it exists in, in the United States. And that, that's the I suppose some of that is a cultural thing and some of that is just the, the level of, of perhaps breaches that they've had in the United States and the sensitivity there, that they have to it in general. Yeah. You know, you know I'd, I'd certainly make a point that uh, if you're using a lot of open source software in your solution, and open source is absolutely great. It's really uh, democratized uh, the software development business and taken some control away from the very large um, software product companies. But you also need to take responsibility when you're employing OSS software in your solution that you are responsible for making sure that that, you know, that that struts library, that um, Hibernate library, that Sprint, Spring library is kept up to date, you know, with the latest trust, the latest uh, security uh, upgrades and updates. And in the OSS world, that's a little bit difficult. If it's within you're buying an IBM solution, then it's up to them to be able to kind of upgrade it. But in OSS, it's up to the developer to be able to do it. So uh, you don't just kind of build it and put it out there and leave it there. Yeah, it's a it's a really valid point, John. About you know, if you look at the markets in in Europe and in Ireland, you know, there's there's a a desire to go for the the quick and cheap solution. And I, I've worked in in development and sales and development myself, and you almost have to justify the the price when. You're going to go. No, this is not just a website. You, what you see at the front is the front, but there's a whole system behind it. It's like the iceberg. You know, you see most of the iceberg exists under the water, and a lot of clients don't see that, and um, it can be very frustrating because, as you said, the the market is way more more mature in the states, and the understanding is there. Maybe it's an education thing, but. It can it can be a frustrating pl place to be. I'm not gonna. You don't have to comment on that. It's just a, a comment. I, I, I agree 100. <laughs> percent Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, but you talked about the dark side and the bright side of the force with regards um, uh, uh, development and data. Uh, one one of the lovely stories I saw was when you were involved in, and I and you, you used drones and you used IoT in the health sector. Can we tell our audience about those, John? Sure. Um, uh, we, we started, uh, we're a services company uh, with some great software development practices uh, in play here. 
And one of the things that we always wanted to do is that we always wanted to give, you know, never, never close off the possibility to moving into product development or moving into ventures that are in a slightly different field from what we do. And again, it kind of goes back to keeping the company kind of fresh, keeping the, keeping its options open as to what avenues it'll explore in the future. So um, we started getting into kind of mobile development when everybody else started getting into mobile development and we kind of stuck with it and uh, it went from everybody was going to do mobile into not really got into kind of responsive design more than mobile development. But we had, um, we, we have a product uh, out in the marketplace, the Safe Tracks product, which is a search and rescue product. I think it's about 10 or 12 countries that have it now across the world and uh, it's been very successful for us. And it's also been very successful from a, um, a software product development uh, perspective and really taking the, the skills that we have as a dev shop and really looking at that building product level, um, building software to product level. It's actually interesting. One of our clients is now um, talking about the, the quality that they need within their software development uh, systems. It needs to be at the product level rather than just being at the IT level. So you're talking about kind of engineer. We talk about getting getting IT solutions up to the kind of engineering quality that you actually have in products, something that needs to work in the mass market. So we, we built this multilingual product. It's got to be very robust. It's got to work kind of offshore and very frugal network situations. Uh, people trust in it. There's a distress button on it. And uh, it's it's been used in rescues in uh, South Africa and Norway and Ireland. So we're really, really happy with it. So we we knew we could build, um, we knew we understood the mobile platform, the mobile architecture, the Android and iOS architectures really, really well because we had to work at a very detailed level with them. Um, and, and, and again, I think I mentioned this uh, last week is that um, uh, organizations such as ourselves grow by, by you know, developing new social networks. And uh, if we if we keep working with the same clients in the same verticals, then we kind of lose that opportunity to explore other ideas and look at other avenues. And so uh, through a good friend of mine who is involved in Irish community rapid response, he came to me and said, uh, look, uh, you, you guys really know an awful lot about kind of mobile development. Is there anything we can do about uh, CPR applications? Um, I said, yeah, there's about 60 CPR applications out of there, uh, out in the marketplace. Uh, what, what were you thinking? I said, well, it's something that could really, you know, guide people into, um, uh, into carrying out CPR. And then, you know, John started talking to me, John Kearney was the guy's name. He started talking to me then about the, the survivability stats of people carrying out CPR and your chance of survival if you had a cardiac infraction outside of a, of a hospital environment or something like 7%. And if somebody carries out CPR, then you can maybe double it, maybe double it. But CPR is very, very hard to do. So we, we took a shot at this and we said, okay, we're going to need to partner with somebody. And we, you know, we hadn't done a huge amount of kind of uh, academic partnering. Um, but we met some fantastic people in UCC, the Health Information Systems Research Center, and Dr. Kira Fitzgerald. And uh, we started working with Kira and her team. So we got some really good mathematicians and scientists on board with us. Then we worked with John to get um, a cardiologist from the Cork University Hospital. We got together in a room and we kind of modeled out what this application could look like understanding at the time that we were going to build something for the footprint of a phone but we really needed something that would be the size of a pebble or something the size of maybe a, maybe a phone maybe a smartwatch something like that so we I, you know what i mentioned last week is that we're about 98 percent there in the algorithm there's about two percent of the code that need to be really tightened up as we're dealing with the the uh the accelerometers and the sensor packs on the phone to to uh to help us and really we, we got the the phone you put the phone between your hands and you carry out cpr and the phone can give you audio and uh, visual feedback that if you're carrying out the cpr correctly and as well as doing that, of course, behind the scenes, because, of course, it's a smartphone, it is sending an alert to a local community first responder. So it basically sends a message up to a server and basically says to the server, I'm doing CPR here. Can you get somebody to help me? The server, using some of the safe tracks logic that we've got from our search and rescue product, um, geolocates a community first responder, sends them a ping, well, an SMS message with a location saying CPR started here. We then can, of course, take that that emergency distress message that we have, that we've received, and we can send that to uh, a messaging center to alert, you know, professional medical uh, um, first aiders or, or first responders. Um, 
And as well, the application as the CPR is being carried out is is uh, gathering all that CPR data and storing it in the phone and actually transmitting it uh, as well to another server so we can actually capture all of that CPR data. So the final, uh, the final step that we needed to execute really was uh, on something where we really took a leap forward and said, okay, CPR is now being carried out. A community first responder has been notified. The authorities has also, have also been notified. So what's the first proper 21st century thing to do is to dispatch an autonomous drone. So we've worked with our partners in DroneSAR in integrating their uh, drone technology, their DJI drone technology into, again, the Safe Tracks Maritime Search and Rescue uh, product. So in taking um, the ping for where CPR is carried out, we can generate, task, generate a, a tasking message to a ne- nearby CPR drone, a drone which is carrying an AED, and basically saying CPR has been carried out uh, in this following location. This is a safe place to land. And you can basically, with the software that um, the drone star guys have developed, it'll automatically task the drone and fly the drone to that location. Now, as I mentioned, rewinding it to the very start, this is alpha software. We're really kind of demonstrating capability to be able to connect these various different actors around a particular emergency scenario with, you know, early, I'm going to call it early uh, 21st century technology, which are really what I'm calling the first generation of smartphones. When we're moving into the IoT world, um, whether we're using um, uh, Sigfox networks or NB-IoT networks, but essentially you're looking at very small footprint devices, very, very tiny devices um, with with uh, batteries that can last, you know, a couple of months to five years to 20 years sometimes on the, on the Sigfox network. You're looking at a ubiquitous device network that can be available then to either to emergency first responders. You're looking at drones that which which can be a hell of a lot smarter than what, than what they are right now. So we're really just looking at a it's 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 a it would be impossible to have a bounded conversation about where that technology could go because yeah. it is accelerating so fast and the options are just so immense as to you know what the solutions could be. Elements of what I've mentioned you know are in place today and working today in Rwanda in in Central Africa. Um, we in Europe have got different issues that we need to deal with, whether it's the electromagnetic spectrum that which is licensed or um, controlled versus uncontrolled airspace and, and transponders, but these will be solved over time. And uh, I think the proliferation of, if I call it cheap technology, um, very accessible technology, which is no longer in the arms of, of uh, governments or large spending organizations like the, the HSE uh, or our National Health Service or the like, um, it's making, uh, you know, it, I have to say that it, that it's broadening the horizons for uh, available technology paths into the future. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, exciting times. It is indeed. And I love the way you've connected the dots between all those and you've thought about the user journey, if you will, uh, from everybody, every actor involved. But when you, when you think of, actually, as you said, where it's going and you think of connected devices or even, you know, as, as stuff like Fitbits get smarter and, you know, wearable, actual clothing gets smart. And then you think of AR, like I was thinking actually, w- w- you know, Apple are about to announce a big AR play that when, when wearables like AR becomes an actual designed glasses, like a Ray-Ban or something that people start wearing, this being able to look through the lens and actually be able to do cpr you've you've you're planting the seeds of a platform that can do all those things and by the time the tech catches up with it you'll have a really nice infrastructure in place yeah you said it you said it i mean we're we're doing it today you would say with with 1990s infrastructure um you know with you know wi-fi infrastructure broadband infrastructure wireless broadband infrastructure that's there using using devices that are not necessarily designed to, uh, for the for the purpose that we are intending them we're taking just normal white goods and kind of pressing them into uh, into service um but of course the software that develop that you're developing that we are developing was java software that developing is entirely portable so the hardware platform is changing and will be miniaturized um so it, it gives us an opportunity really to at least to kind of play out how, how some of these things would work i think your your example there with the the AR glasses, 
um, elements like elements of that are in place today within the defense infrastructure and uh, you know I, I think you've you've nailed it for where some of that is going yeah yeah well John it's it's been a pleasure talking to you where can people reach uh, reach you and the team we're we're based in Cork our, our website will be 8 West Consulting we're on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and Twitter brilliant John well it's been a pleasure talking to you CEO and co-founder of 8 West Consulting John Murphy thanks for joining us thank you Aidan thank you